Hi everyone, uh, my name is David Rao and I'm the music teacher who blogs at makemomentsmatter.org. You can also find my ideas on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube, Twitter, and a variety of other places when you search for my name, David Rao, um, or Make Moments Matter Music Education. I'm so excited to be sharing again with you this week. Um, everything this week at school has gone absolutely to plan, so it's perfect. And I can't wait to start sharing some of those lesson ideas with you. Um, I'm gonna be doing a couple different things tonight, um, but first let me remind you of some things. If you have uh, watched these videos before, or even if you haven't, um, normally uh, if you go to, if I talk about something, a book or a resource or something else, I would say find that on the links page, and I'm gonna say that again tonight, find it on the links page. Um, the links page doesn't currently uh, work because there's no there are no links for this week. Because um, normally between school and taping this video, sharing this live video, I'm able to get on the computer and do things. Didn't it? It didn't happen tonight. Uh, so I'm gonna, after the video is done, I'm going to go in and fill in those links. So all the books, all the resources, all the games, everything that I talk about is going to show up on that links page. You can find that at makemomentsmatter.org/video, or you can just go to my webpage, makemomentsmatter.org, click the video tab, and it'll be in there under Musical Mondays, uh, 2019 or sorry, 2020, 2021, whatever year this is. Um, or if you're watching live now on Instagram, on my link in bio, or uh, Facebook at the bottom of the caption for this video is a direct link. Okay, that was a long time to say that. Um, also, I hope that um, as we go along that you will ask questions, that you will leave comments um, in the, the chat for either Instagram or Facebook. Um, that conversation is always so helpful. I love last week I would like share something and someone else would say like, what's that link? And someone else would respond before I could even see you. The comments. So thank you, number one, for helping the conversation move along, but also um, the interactions and the conversations that you share are so cool. It's fun for me when the live video is done to go back and read through those comments and um, see those conversations. If you want that conversation to continue, you can go to my Facebook group, which is Every Moment Matters Music Education Community. Just search that on Facebook or click that link in the lives, the, the links page, and, and you'll find that. And it's some great conversations happen there. It's fun to share resources. It's a place where you can ask questions. Um, this is the year to ask questions and to say like, how are you doing it? Please tell me or, or what's working for you. And so I hope that you'll continue that conversation on um, the Facebook page. Okay, it's it's such a good thing that so many of you are, are here and, and spending your time tonight because luckily I have all the answers. Um, everything has gone just perfectly at school and I know exactly what's gonna happen with my students. I'm completely comfortable with how I'm gonna teach everything. So it's good you're here so I can just tell you all the answers, but I'm only gonna give you like one a week so you're gonna have to come back. Um, no, that's not true. Um, and <laughs> just a, nobody has the answers right now. We are all in a completely different setting. Um, everything is is up in the air. I, I went back to, to pre-planning today. Um, and if I had done a tally mark for every time someone had said, well, normally it's this way, or but we're going to have to change that, or we'll have to think about how we're going to do that, or... Uh, not this year, you know, like it's everything is different. And, and one of the things that is really interesting is even within a district, um, the rules are different. The things are different. So like one school might be like, well, we're going to do it this way. Another school might do it. Well, we're going to do it this way. So it's just it's all different. So I wanted to bring that up to say uh, and remind you of what I said last week in this live video. Three things that um, I'm going to remind myself of every day. Um, the not quite real beatitude. Blessed are the flexible, for they shall not break. So be as flexible as possible. Uh, think about ways you can adapt and change. Um, I love to think about that idea from the rules of improv, improv acting, uh, to say yes and. So if someone's like, hey, can you do, sure, I'd love to do that. And I was thinking maybe we could add this other thing, or you know, how can you add to the, the learning and the conversation happening there? And then give yourself grace um, as things are happening, because uh, n none of us know how this is supposed to work. So we're all just sort of uh, building the plane while we're on the plane. You know, we're all just trying to make it happen. And so giving yourself grace, giving other people grace, giving your students grace is really, really important. Um, and uh, one other thing I'm going to say this week, don't go overboard. Uh, because I think there are some people who are like, I gotta flip everything on its head and do everything completely differently, and it's all gotta be this whatever, and my Bitmoji classroom must be perfect, and what what my classroom classroom is never perfect, so how can my Bitmoji classroom be perfect? I still haven't figured out how to do that, by the way. Um, 
give give yourself a, a, some a, a chance to to not go overboard. So I for I say that because we don't know exactly how things are going to work. So what I am doing, um, I'm going back through resources I have. I'm pulling things off of shelves and and going through, flipping through, and looking. What can I use? How can I use that? What you know? How can things be used in a different way? Um, for instance, what do you need? What do you do if like the technology fails? Because it probably will, right? At some point. Um, and so I was like, Ooh, what about textbooks? I've got them. I rarely use them, but I have them, right? So what can I do? Or if I don't want to have to pass out textbooks because I'm worried about germs, could I? photocopy them? Or could I pull an activity that I really like from one of the pages? Could I share it through my document camera? You know, what can I do to adapt and use that resource in a new way? Pull out those resources, um, bring them back in the conversation because I think that they're going to be really helpful. So don't go overboard. Don't feel like you have to do everything or create everything or make everything perfect. Nothing's going to be perfect this year. But look through your textbooks, look through resources you already have, pull out lessons that you know work and adapt those. Um, pull out, go to Teachers Pay Teachers and get that thing that's going to save you five hours of work. Don't spend the extra time. You know, like this is the year to not go overboard. Okay, <laughs> that's it. That's my new addition for the week. So I, I have uh, Blessed with the Flexible for They Shall Not Break. Say yes and, oh, sorry, say yes and what else can we do? Uh, and give yourself grace. And now this week, don't go overboard. That's my rule number four for the year. Um, because you know, it, it's easy to overload and to do too much and that everyone is stressed. We are stressed, students are stressed, parents are stressed, administrators are super stressed, bus drivers are stressed, I mean, everyone. So um, just remember those things as you go into the year. Be flexible, yes and, give yourself grace and don't go overboard. Okay, today in, um, in this video, again, I'm not going to be sharing the exact lessons that I used this week because I have not taught yet this week. Um, I still don't have students. Um, but so what I am going to do is I'm going to tell you, um, I'm going to go through a lesson idea of how I think I'm going to use a lesson and adapt it. Not sure on the grade, so maybe multiple grades, I'll be honest. Um, I want to share a movement idea because I think that's one of the things that we're especially struggling with. How do we include movement? uh in COVID-19 world how do we do that um, and then I want to share some books and things that I think are super fun and that we'll be able to use and adapt so that's my plan for today but I'm going to start with um, a lesson quick update about my school so as of uh, an hour ago the school board had an emergency board meeting because we thought we were going to be all digital um, for the first several weeks and then maybe not so, <laughs> so who knows um, let me just tell you what I think is going to happen. I think I'm going to be teaching in a hybrid. Many of you are familiar with that idea because it's probably happening in your school or might be happening in your school or district or near you. Um, and the, the idea of a hybrid in my district, the way it would work, and I'm going to explain this so you can sort of understand how my lessons might look and they might work and that might help you be able to adapt yours. Um, in our district, the way the hybrid works is every homeroom is basically split in two. And on Monday, Tuesday, the first half of that homeroom comes to school. On Thursday, Friday, the other half of that homeroom comes to school. Nobody comes to school on Wednesday. That's an all virtual day, right? I don't know exactly how that all works out for the classroom teacher. There's a lot of weird overlap and things happening. But for me, as the music teacher, in my school this year, I'm going to see the same homeroom every day for the whole week. So if I see like Mrs. Jones's first grade, I'll see the first half of her kids on Monday, Tuesday, the second half on Thursday, Friday, and I'll see us all together in a combined like Zoom or Teams or whatever um, online synchronous class on Wednesday. The, the, the complication to that is I'm going to see the first half of Ms. Jones's students on Monday, Tuesday. Where are the other kids? They're at home doing digital learning. Who's coming up with those digital learning lessons? Me. So while I'm teaching half her class in person, the other half has to access my digital lessons online uh, on Monday, Tuesday. We're all together and then everything flips. And that half that had the digital lessons then has in-person and the half that did not, or that was in-person is now doing digital. So that creates some complications because if I'm lesson planning, in my head, I, I used to think like, well, okay, Monday, Tuesday will be like an introduction and then Wednesday will like build on what we learned on Monday, Tuesday, except uh, no, because what we learned Monday, Tuesday 
half the class is going to get on Thursday, Friday. So like it can't quite build that way. So I'm having to restructure and rethink like how do I lesson plan? And it might just mean that like I'm not like I might be building Monday, Tuesday and I might be building digital, digital and Wednesday might be completely different. So it's like it's confusing. But all that to say, I'm going to share in this lesson that I share in just a second, I'm going to share what I'm going to do in person. I'm going to share how we sort of do a synchronous version on that Wednesday. And I'm going to share some of the digital things that we do. My plan for the digital lessons are going to be asynchronous. And just that means not live, right? Like on your own, on your own time. Um, so what I'm planning is all of the stuff that I did in the spring, that like emergency teaching stuff I did in the spring, um, at my school, that was all asynchronous. So all spring, I was like recording, um, reading through books. I was recording me singing songs. I was recording blah, you know, whatever. Um, and so now I am going to pull all of those resources and things that I've already compiled and come up with. And that's going to become my digital stuff as much as possible along the theme of everything else I'm doing in class. But I'm going to pull that stuff that I've already done. And if you're like, Ooh, yes, I already did that. Cool for you. If you're like, Ooh, I didn't do any of that. Or I didn't teach that way. Um, and you are now, um, I have a, a website where I've compiled a lot of the things that I've done or ideas that I've come up with. It's dig digitalmusiclessons.weebly.com. I'll put that on the links page. Um, it, so that it gives you some ideas of what could you do of a like, watch this video and then answer a few questions or research as composer and then whatever, or here's a fun website to go to or what, you know, so things that you can give students to sort of do on their own time on those asynchronous days. But I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'm going to do here in a minute. So just, just know that this whole lesson, they're like different ways. There's the kids who are going to learn with me in person. There are the kids who are going to be doing their own thing digitally. And then there's going to be the, the synchronous class. So the, the lesson idea I want to start with, like my kids who I'm going to see in person on a Monday morning. And I wanted to start with um, this book. It's a book that I, um, I heard my first year of teaching 10 years ago. Um, and I, I heard it in um, through a local ORF chapter. Go join your local ORF chapter, especially if you, um, if you don't already, or especially even if you think like, oh, but we aren't going to have any in-person um, like meetings. Guess what? Every ORF chapter around the country and Kodai chapter and like local music ed chapter is, is figuring out how they can do like digital workshops and how they can share things. And, and some of the stuff they're sharing is super cool. So it is worth joining your ORF chapter, um, even if you're not going to like be there to eat the mini muffins and drink the coffee and stuff like you're still going to get great ideas. So anyway, this book was introduced to me at the very first workshop I went to ORF and running at my now uh, home chapter, Kansas Orf chapter 10 years ago. And I heard um, a different lesson than what I'm gonna share today. So I'm not resharing that person's lesson because it doesn't quite work with how I'm gonna do it now. But I wanted to share the book because the book inspired um, the lesson from today. Facebook, this is gonna be, it's gonna work for you. Hopefully you can read this, these letters correctly. Instagram, I'm so sorry, it's backwards. It's, uh, it's the FaceTime camera. I'm so sorry. Okay, so this is called Chewy Louie, and it's written by, oh gosh, sorry. I want to make sure, Howie Schneider. His autograph was here on the front, so I couldn't quite read his handwriting. Anyway, Chewy Louie, and I, I first learned about this book a long time ago, so that means probably you'll be able to find it on those discount book websites like Better World Books, ABE Books, Thrift Books. Just search discount book website and you'll be able to find all those. Or maybe in your library or on Amazon, I don't know. But I'll put a link to this on Amazon so you can snag the ISBN number later if you want. Okay, Chewy Louie. Let's see if I can get this here. Ooh, let me try and zoom in. Yeah, get that. Okay. One day my father brought home a little black puppy. He was very cute and always hungry. We called him Chewy Louie. He ate everything we put in his bowl. And then he ate the bowl. My mother was very worried. He'll get sick, she said. And this is a time where like, if I were doing this with a younger class, I would like pause and say like, why would he get sick? Why is she worried? You know, like, oh, cause he ate something non-food, right? Like you can have those conversations. That's fun. It's a good, um, a good moment to have with your kids. If they're younger and you're like, wait, I don't know. Cause that also sets up the premise of the book. 
He won't get sick, my father said. He's just a puppy. Then he bought Louie a new bowl. The new bowl didn't make Louie sick either. And this is again where I would be like, what, wait, what, you know, so then we can process through as a class. Oh, father got him a new bowl and he ate that bowl too. I would just do that with kids because I would read it as is. And then I would do that with kids because the text doesn't make it completely clear. And if they can't see the picture, that makes it very difficult. So again, if I'm reading this with my class, I'm probably doing it under a document camera, you know, like one of those things that like shoots down at your desk. And I would be reading it here because I would want students to see all these pictures and I would want students to get that, if that makes sense. I'm, I can't say to kids like, crowd up close, we're going to read this book. Like, no, I can't do that. So um, I would probably be reading this under document camera so they can get some of that um, extra. But I would also stop and process through the book with kids. Louis slept with me in bed at night when he wasn't eating my toys. Look, there he is, eating the toys. Louis ate my trains before they reached the station. And kids may not have train, train tracks at home. Train station games, uh, model train. So you might have explained that one too. Then he ate the station itself. My mother was very worried. My father said he would buy me a new set of trains. He's just a puppy, father said. What? Wait, hold on. Is that right? Did I skip a page? No, nope. <laughs> sorry. One day, Louis started to eat the po back porch. My mother was horrified. My father was a little concerned, too. That's some puppy, he said. We decided to take Louis to a vet. You could be like, why are we taking Louis to a vet? You could have, you could ask kids that question. That's a good, that's a good question to ask because they'd have to use their context clues. It does not specifically say. We decided to take Louis to a vet because he's eating non-food objects and that's probably bad for his stomach. Like it doesn't say that implicitly, so it's fun to ha have kids make that connection because probably some kids are doing it right away and probably some kids aren't. And if you just barrel through the book, they might miss the meaning. And so it's fun to like ask them a question like, why would you take him to a vet? Is he, does, he's not throwing up or he, he just looks, you know, like it'd be, it'd be good to have that conversation. With him. The vet said, to feed him more. He's just a growing puppy, he said. Then the vet gave us the bill. Look at the vet's office. Oh, that poor vet, look. Louie chewed his table, the chair in the waiting room, the vet's pant leg, um, part of the car. Oh my goodness. So the, the the vet said to feed him more because he just must be too hungry, but I don't know if that's true because he's eating not food things. That night, my father and mother sat down to figure out what to do. I was afraid they were going to give Louis away. Again, you could have a conversation there about why that would happen. My father hired a construction crew to repair the house. My birthday party was coming up soon and my mother wanted the place to look nice. What a cute puppy, said one of the workmen. They went inside to talk to my father about the job. Then they came back out and saw their truck. Then they quit the job. So again, this is one where if kids can't see the picture, this is not going to make sense. So you need to make sure that you've got this under a document camera or pulled up on a screen or something. Maybe if you, I, I'm not exactly sure if you can buy this on Amazon, like as a Kindle book, but if you can and do like Kindle reader, that might be helpful because then you can have a big picture on the screen. But I, I have not looked into the, if that's an option. Because all it says is then they came back out and saw their truck, then they quit the job. And if the kids can't see why or make the inference that Chewy Louie ate the wood and that made the workman quit, you know, that they've missed out. So worth getting it, big picture. My father was furious. I thought he was really going to send Louie away this time. He decided to hire a trainer. The trainer arrived the next day and immediately went to work. Look, the door isn't even all the way open and he goes, sit. See, the trainer's trying to fix Louie. And now he says, no, 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 bad, bad dog, bad dog, bad dog, no, 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 bad dog, bad, stop that. The trainer arrived and immediately went to work and so did Louie. 
then my father had to hire another trainer. See, look what Louie did. Oh my gosh. Ooh. Oh, the new trainer. She decided to, or she brought a guitar along and sang songs to Louie about the error of his ways. I love you when you don't chew. You bet your pretty teeth I do. It, it's not nice to eat the table. Even if you're able, a wood's not good for you. I think Louie liked her songs very much, but he really loved her guitar. Oh no, what did Louie do to the guitar? He ate it. Yeah, and you could see some of And if that, then you could even, like, if you had a guitar, you could pull it up and show, like, oh my gosh, he ate through this. This is great. You know, it'd be fun to um, to have that quick conversation if you've got your guitar there. Also, I know this was the loveliest singing you've ever heard. <laughs> we didn't have any more time to worry about Louie now. My birthday party was tomorrow, and we all had the hard work to fix the place up. My mother wanted the party to be a big success. But instead, all her worst fears came true. Louis was horrible. You say, why was he horrible? And you can look again. This is the one where they have to compare the picture to uh, what they're hearing in the story. Louis chewing through the table, right? And he's chewing through all the things and he's sort of ruining the party. I woke up the next morning feeling miserable. I knew now that we couldn't keep Louie. I decided to play one last game of fetch with him. Although I wasn't really, it wasn't really fetch. I just threw the sticks and Louie ate them. But not today. Louie brought the stick back today. Hey, Dad, I shouted. Look at Louie. He's not chewing anymore. Even my mother was impressed. Look, dad is so positive. He's <laughs> so Louis was changing. He was getting big and older and bigger every day. He didn't even eat my toys anymore. My mother still worried. Do you think he stopped chewing for good? She said. Of course, said my father. He's not a puppy anymore. Look, and you can even see... Um, there, all the workers are repairing the house. So that's great because now Louie's not gonna chew anything because he's done chewing things. So he's not gonna chew. <gasps> oh no. Oh no, look at this page. Look what happened. Oh my gosh. Oh no. What's he done? He's chewed right through the book. Oh no, how did Louie even get a hold of this book? How did that dog in, in the book get out of the book and then chew the book? I mean, it's, it's a super fun book and there's so many things you can do with it, right? Um, and I, like I said along the way, I would, as we're going, I would stop and ask questions. I would ask clarifying questions. I would assess to make sure that they knew what was happening in the story before I zoomed through, because this is going to lead to a lot of other things in the lesson. And if they're not clear about that, it it mess it misses things so especially if you're with a younger grade who would maybe not make the inferences right away you need to stop and have those conversations if you're dealing with three four or five then probably you don't need to have as many stops but it's still worth um checking it so i would you know we could have a little talk after that with the students about you know louis eating and oh my gosh how terrible um and then I would add in this little poem and the poem goes louis 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 likes to eat Crun or sorry, chewy, crunchy, salty, or sweet. Louie, Louie, Louie likes to eat. Chewy, crunchy, salty, or sweet. And I would just speak the poem and I would have the, you know, the kids learn it and say it with me. And then um, the, the next of what is, you know, um, I would add body percussion. So as we're speaking the words, we could pat. So we could do Louie, Louie, Louie likes to eat. Chewy, crunchy, salty, or sweet. I do that a couple times to make sure they all get it. They can transfer. With younger grades, I do that a couple times. With older grades, I do it maybe once more to make sure that they can transfer the words to the body percussion. And then after doing it, you know, maybe on, on your knees patting, I would maybe switch to clapping. Louie, Louie, Louie likes to eat. 
chewy, crunchy, salty, or sweet. Right? Okay. Well, then, once we've done that, I could then maybe add another level. What else could we do? We could stomp. Oh, my gosh. That'd be so cool. We could snap. That'd be tricky. Bluey, bluey, bluey likes to eat. Chewy, crunchy, salty, or sweet. Obviously, I would not be doing the snapping with kindergarten because I can barely do one snap a minute. So I would not. But you could you could change the level, right? And then once they've done that a couple times, then you could all you could have them alternate levels. So if you were to write this, you know, like grab your whiteboard, right, and like you could write out the poem if you wanted with notation, if you wanted, or you could just teach it by rote. But if you wrote it out with notation, even if you just had the words up on the screen, you could have like the top line be clapping, the bottom line be patting. So Bluey, Louie, Louie likes to eat. Chewy, crunchy, salty, or sweet. And then you could switch. Bluey, Louie, Louie likes to eat. Chewy, crunchy, salty, or sweet. You could, you know, if you want. Then you can have them alternate on their own. Louie, Louie, Louie likes to eat. Chewy, crunchy, salty, or sweet. You know, you could have them as they want, sort of improvising, changing when they want, if they want. But I would say maybe two levels, just the padding or um, the clapping. Okay, so uh, then I would then uh, let them do maybe three levels if they wanted, padding, clapping, snapping, right? Um, so that's, that's maybe where I would go with the body progression first. And then once you, we've got that under our belt, you could do uh, with the poem, one level, two level, three levels. Then you could take out the poem. Instead, just do the percussion. And they could think the words in their head. Right, they could come up with that in their head. And then that's fun too, because then you could uh, you know, have one side of the room say it and the other one do the body percussion and then switch. Or you could just have them all think it in their head if you think they've done enough times that they know it. It's fun to take that away. Another extension, if you want, you could have kids come up with things that Louie might eat. And this would lead me into a new part of my lesson. So um, I could do like, what is something Louie might eat? And the kids can be like, oh, apples. Apples. Ah, perfect. What is something Louie might eat? And the, the cool thing about this is kids are like, you know, if they're like, I don't understand music. I can't play an instrument. I can't sing. But you're like, name a food. They're like, pizza. Okay, you got them, right? Like, <laughs> they can contribute to this because they have eaten food before in their lifetime, right? And they can just remember a lot of us remember the food, right? Or thinking about the food. So um, you could have them come up with what is something Louie might eat. and But even more than that, it, you might have those kids who are like, pillows? Yeah, because the book is all about, where did I put it? I don't even know where I put it. Oh, the book is all about Louie eating non-food things. So you, you could go through and you could come up with and you could brainstorm on your whiteboard like you could get out and you could write down like all the food things Louie might eat you could do all of the non-food things he might eat you could have uh, kids in their own space give them like okay you got 30 seconds to come up with one super fun thing you think Louie might eat or maybe something you like to eat that Louie might try whatever right um, and then from there you can take all those food words and you can do so much with them you could have kids uh, think about how to clap or pat or stomp that food word. Um, so like, let's see, brownie, brownie, right? Or um, let's see, what's another thing? Um, barbecue, we're in Kansas City. Barbecue, right? There are so many, you could have them come up with that. So then um, that makes me think about, you know, all last year and year before and whatever, like I did all these lessons where I printed out these little centers, right? And the center cards have food words on them. Bread roll. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me find a non-controversial food. Somebody sorted these in, okay. Jam. Graham cracker. And to all of you Southerners, it is not Graham Cracker. It's not, sorry. I lived in Atlanta for a year and I heard people try to say that. Incorrect, sorry. Let's see, oh, 
pumpkin pie. This is obviously the Thanksgiving set, right? Okay, so um, you could uh, take these things that you've already made and you could even subdivide. And so like this is bag number one. I could split it and put half into um, a Ziploc bag. This is like one A and one says one B. So you're not sharing things, right? But you could then hand these out for younger grades or older grades or whatever and have them play around with the things. Last year or two years ago, I shared a lesson called Everything Stew, which was like a poem. And then you played around and composed and did stuff with these. You could do that again. And that'd be really easy to do. Um, only now it's related to the book Chewy Louie. And you could have them um, rearrange these little words into, or their own words, right, into different patterns. You could come up with your own um, eight beat pattern. So I've got in the little resource that I made, I've got a little worksheet that would allow you to do that pretty easily to put the food word on the line and the rhythm above it. Or if you want, if you're letting them brainstorm and come up with their own, I also in that resource have um, just a little thing that helps them sort of categorize. Like pizza, where would it go? Ta, ta di, pizza, uh, no, that's not it. Pizza, no. P, no. <laughs> pizza, right? So you could, you could use this worksheet if they came up with their own list of things, you could have them put them in here. Or, or like you're doing Chewy Louie, uh, well, uh, back deck. Okay, you could have them figure that out. Some of those words that they come up with, because they're not from the bag, the bag separates or, or, or limits the kids by what foods they can do, but some of the things that they come up with may not fit. Guitar, that has a pickup in it. So that's not really gonna, it's not really guitar, uh, unless maybe you're from Texas. Guitar, I don't know, but the way I say it is guitar which is da da, it's like a pickup, it's an anacrusis. So it doesn't really fit there, but you could have that conversation with older grades and with younger grades, you could be like, oh, sh I don't know, it's, I don't, it sounds weird, right? So you could take these things that if you've already made this, already printed this out, you could you know, split these up. If you're like, I only have eight bags and I'm gonna have 14 kids. Well, take each bag, cut it in half, put some in one and some in another, and that's fine. And then um, the, the cool thing, especially if I'm doing this with kids, is if I plan it correctly, um, I can hand a bag out and then not use it for several days. And I'm told that that if they sit there, I don't have to sanitize them because it, the germs will die and whatever. And um, if I let them sit long enough, um, it'll be fine. So that's what that, I'm going to take these old resources. This goes back to what I said at like the beginning of the video. Don't overdo it. I'm going to take these resources I already have, and I'm just going to repurpose them, just like. Um, the, the digital games that I made. I showed you last week a game for an iPad, um, and it's a game where you get to like click through and, and flip through and play the game. I originally made that with the idea that it would be for a smart board, but last year when COVID hit for the first time, I was like, well, um, we're not in the classroom and how we're gonna make this work. So I made it, I optimized it so you can use it on a tablet, you can use it on a Chromebook, you can use it, you can use it in Google Classroom, you can use it in Canvas, whatever. You can put it in um, and kids can access that at home. So those are, those are all things that you can take and reuse now connected to this lesson of Chewy Louie, right? Um, it can lead to composition. You can do worksheets. You can do kids coming up with their own words and rearranging and doing their own thing. You can have them string together words they think are disgusting, like foods together, like, I don't know, grape nuts and chocolate sauce and tomatoes and garlic and I mean I don't know whatever they think would be gross they can come with good things totally up to the kids but that um, it, it, it's, it makes it really interesting they're thinking really hard because they're trying to figure out the rhythms of words and they're interfacing with the content okay for the digital lesson for that week because this would be an all-in-person sort of a thing for the digital lesson where kids have to sort of click through and do their own thing um, I could take that iPad game that I talked about, and it, it would work through Canvas or Google Classroom or Apple Classroom. I could uh, send it out and they could click through and do that on their own at home. That'd be easy to do. Um, there are so many songs that talk about food or especially like foods that don't quite fit. Like um, 
you could do Farmer Brown's cow and say like maybe the cow is sick because she ate something that made her sick. Farmer Brownie had a cow, had a cow, had a cow. She got sick. I don't know how. All she does or all she said was moo. And then the other animals in the neighborhood bring her food, um, try and make her feel better, things to make her feel better. Right? That'd be fun for some grade. And if you're doing a lesson where you could record yourself singing that and share that with kids, that'd be a great lesson to put in your um, asynchronous lesson. Um, on top of Old Smokey slash on top of spaghetti would be fun because if you taught them on top of spaghetti, if in a previous lesson you'd learned on top of Old Smokey or in a future lesson you could do on top of Old Smokey, the uh, traditional folk song, and you could talk about those connections either now or later. But on top of spaghetti is a song that I learned when I was in elementary school and I will never forget because it was, um, it was like a cornerstone for my education. <laughs> Um, or any other food song. Um, and, and it'd be fun to share that in a way you could pre-record. Or uh, think about Wednesday when I'm doing the synchronous lesson, the Zoom lesson or whatever. I could teach a song through the video that the kids could learn. We could do actions. They could sing at home. What are some more songs? Songs. Ache and Drum. That'd be a great one. Um, I just did a favorite folk song set for that this summer. Um, and so I could pull that out as I'm teaching. Um, I could, so use those visuals and things. Kids could give me ideas for Ache and Drum. Because the cool thing about Ache and Drum is that um, you can sing the, the traditional original song or you can come up with your own version. So it might be fun to sing the traditional original to them as an option. And then once they've heard it, you can have them introduce new elements in that synchronous way and they could sing along at home with their videos muted, right? Um, or we could just sing their ideas. Aiken Drum would be a great one. Mrs. Murphy's Chowder is another really fun one that's maybe not as well known where um, Mrs. Murphy and the Murphy family is like having a party and we all go over and she brings out this chowder, this soup, and someone has like put a pair of pants in it. <laughs> so, so that Chewy Louie might like that, right? Like that might connect. Um, and, and that'd be a super fun, um, another song to sing. I also did a video last year where I shared this book, Peanut Butter and Cupcake, and a whole lesson that I did with that. So I'll link that in the comments, but this is another book. If you already have it, pull it back out, use it again. It is food and rhythm and music related and why not make those connections? So Chewy Louie is maybe where I would start. I would add in the other food songs, I'd add in the other food connections, um, it maybe find a cool, YouTube video or whatever. Um, there's that, um, the video of the Just Dance kids doing, oh, I'm a gummy bear, oh, I'm a gummy bear. So that would be a fun one to put in your um, online only class of, of things to do um, that, that kids could do. It would be another fun connection. I think anything you wanna throw in there that's food or, uh, related would, would fit a theme if you care about matching a theme, but would also sort of flow together with the other lessons of the week. Okay, so that's Chewy Louie. The, the book Chewy Louie, again, by uh, Howie Schneider. Um, I will put a link to that um, to my Amazon page just so you can get the ISBN number if you want to buy it new from Amazon. I bet you probably could. Um, I see on Instagram someone said it is not available as a Kindle book. Sad. Uh, but you could probably get it in a discount book place. I got mine from thriftbooks.com. Oh, you can't really see that. Thriftbooks.com. Okay, I wanted to share real quickly because I have ooh, still some time. I want to share um, a movement idea and then try and get into a few more books and, and some ideas and connections there. I, I've been really stressed about thinking that, you know, these kids are going to be coming in, they're going to be sitting at their desks, they're going to be not touching other kids, they're going to be not really free movement, and the kids are going to want to move. And they're used to coming to specials as that, like, get your wiggles out time. And now for me and my school, if I'm hybrid, that means I am going to their classroom. And so they are not getting up and leaving. They don't even get the, the opportunity to like get up and walk to the music room. Like I'm coming to them. They are staying in their seats all day. So I need to think about ways that I can get them up and moving um, and in a safe way. Uh, and how can I do that and what are some things. So I wanted to share a couple of my ideas with you. Um, the first one is a website called uh, Cosmic Kids Yoga, and I've shared about this before. They have a, a YouTube page with a lot of free videos where this super fun teacher um, takes kids, well, or anyone, through and basically does yoga poses, but like with a story attached to it. So like there's like a Star Wars one, there's like a Jungle Adventure one, all these super fun videos. Um, where kids could like get up from their seat and sort of stay in their space, but still move and do these fun poses. And because she's so like 
so excited and so much fun like kids want to do it and because it's woven through a story kids are connected to it so cosmic kids yoga i'll put a link to that on the links page another fun resource that i have somewhere oh here oh and also i was going to say if you if you have a, a puppet want to con connect a puppet to your chewy louie because why not um what a other animal would just eat indiscriminately anything a goat and so if you have a goat that might be a fun creature to add into a lesson synchronous air synchronous i mean i had the puppets i had to bring it sorry i forgot about that okay but as i was searching for these i i found my goat so there are these cool things called yoga pretzels and my good friend and mentor jennifer donovan shared this with me years ago at my orf levels um and i bought them being like what a cool way to use them and now i'm like oh thank goodness i have this resource because whew, I need something. So what, what yoga pretzels do is they give you like yoga poses, but in um, sort of kid-friendly terms. So let me see if I can find a really cool, simple one. So like you could have like this one, it says bear breath, and it's all about breath and breathing. And it says rest and balance. And on the back, it gives a little poem. Uh, in winter, bears hibernate in caves, sleeping peacefully. Discover your own peace and balance with this special breath. Sit up tall, close your eyes, and go inside. Through your nose, breathe in for a count. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I did not read the second line. Through your nose, breathe in for a count of five, then hold it in for a count of three. You could do it. But it takes you through, right? There are some other poses that are uh, a little bit more um, advanced. So, for example, um, warrior two, or wait, or warrior one. These are basic yoga poses that they can get kids to do. The cool thing about this is if you're doing yoga, that's all, it's like you stay in your space, right? You're not moving around the room, but you are moving. Um, and so on the back, it gives you steps of how to teach kids to get into that pose. So one, I step forward, breathe, and focus. Start in high lunge. And even as a picture, so you can put this on your document camera and show kids. But there are like so many cards. You could do one or per lesson. You could pull out and say like, ooh, looks like we need to get up and move. I'm gonna pull a yoga card. Let's see which one we get. Which pretzel are we gonna get? Now some of them you can't do. Cause like, let me see, I think the yellows, let me pull. Um, yeah, the yellows are like group stuff. Uh, go, stop, back to back. No, wait, <laughs> I'll be taking those out. But this gives me like a whole arsenal of like, ooh, we look like we um, need to get up and move, right? Okay, so yoga pretzels and those are cool. I'll put those on the links page so you can find it. But again, I have another book I wanted to share and this is one that I saw at AOSA conference last year. And just like the book I shared before, I'm not gonna share the person's original lesson because it's their lesson, but I, I took the book and I'm like, ooh, what else can I do with it? Um, and this is a, one that might be really fun to share. This one's called Plants Can't Sit Still by Rebecca E. Hirsch, illustrated by Mia Posada. And I will warn you, uh, I think this one is out of print. <laughs> so look through your library or look through discount book websites because I'm pretty sure you can't get it. Um, new right now sorry it might be old it's not that old <laughs> anyway let me just share with you parts of it plants don't have feet or fins or wings yet they can move in many ways look closely and you'll discover that plants can't sit still reminds me of something else i know that can't sit still kids can't sit still. Plants can wiggle. Can you wiggle? Yeah. And see, uh, seedlings start to grow. Oh, can you grow in your chair? Can you show me a way to grow? You know. They squirm out of spring soil, unfold their leaves, and reach for the warmth and the light. I wonder if we can do that at our desks. Pretend your hands our little seed planted in the ground. Ooh, someone said there's a Kindle version of this plant book. Okay, cool, sorry, <laughs> got distracted. Um, okay, so that's cool, so you can use that. Sorry, anyway, <laughs> imagine your hands are a seed planted in the ground. The seedlings start to grow. 
And you know, there's that kid who's like, <laughs> nope, flowers don't grow that fast. Sorry, Damon. Try again. <laughs> David, probably. They squirm out of the spring soil. They grow taller and taller. They unfold their leaves. And you could demo that or you could see what they come up with and reach for the warmth and the light. Ooh, we're gonna do a big plant now. Can you make your whole body a seed? You might need to stand up for this. You know, and then they could like sit down and do that, right? So this book gives just some sort of fun visuals that you can then take and make into movements. Plants can creep, they slither underground or crawl through tall grass searching for the things that all plants need, water, sunshine, and room to grow. And this could be a fun science connection because if you say plants can creep, no they can't. Plants don't move. How do they creep? And you could talk, especially if you're gonna use this around like um, October, you could talk about pumpkin vines, right? Um, where they slither underground. No they don't, plants are above ground. Wait, what part of them is underground? You, you could have that fun science conversation if you want. And as they search, plants can climb a fence or walk up a wall. It's fun to talk about vining plants like that. Plants can hide from a hungry grasshopper or surprise a fly. Snap! Some plants sleep at night, leaves nodding, flowers folding. Can you just imagine the kids doing this? I think they could do it. Others wake with the stars and lift their faces to the moon. How cool to find a video of, of the plants that do that. Okay, I will, I'm not going to read through the whole thing. It's a super, super cool book, Plants Can't Sit Still by Rebecca E. Hirsch, illustrated by Mia Posada. But I will warn you because it does tumbleweeds and then it does um, seeds exploding out and flying like seeds crawling through, going through the air. Um, what you could do is in your own spot, like it does the, the whirly bird seeds, right? You could like see how they could do that maybe in their own spot. Um, or if you're outside, oh my gosh, this would be perfect. Um, but yeah, there's some things that like would not work as well. You'd have to adapt, but could totally adapt. So this is just like, I pulled this off the shelf because I was like, Ugh, rats, how are we going to do movement? And this was one that I was like, oh my gosh. This could totally be a book that we read in class and in our little desk spots, we could recreate that movement super easily. You could then take it into a lesson where you talk about sciencey things. You could, do, I mean, there's, there's so many things that you could do, so many different options, but super fun. I think it's out of print, except apparently you can buy it on Kindle and I'll put a link to that on the links page. Okay, I just have a few more minutes and that's great. Um, one more thing that I'm, um, Oh, rats, I talk about things I want to talk about. Yes. Ooh, and on that book, Plants Keep Still, you could be like, sorry, you can't move around. You've got roots. you got to stay where you are. You know, you, you, like, that could be your, like, oh, we're going to move, and it's going to be so much fun, but you can't actually move from your spot because you all are plants, and you are rooted in the ground. So <laughs> your connection. Um, okay, so I was also going through my books, and I was thinking about um, how can I connect to other things in ways that maybe I haven't in previous years? And I found all these fun books that like I don't always have time for and I wanted to share about. And one of the things that I'm going to focus on in some of my classes, sort of inspired by my art teacher, I was in her art room and on her word wall, one of the things she had was um, jobs related to art, um, professions that you can do, things you can do uh, that are art related. So it wasn't just artist. You know, it was graphic designer, and it was um, editor, and it was uh, photographer, and it was uh, museum docent, and it was um, sculptor and potter, and uh, you know, all of these different things. So many different things. And so I was like, well, I want to do that with music too. So you could talk about musical jobs, you could get kid ideas, um, and you could do um, some super fun different things where you like have kids come up with musical jobs and then maybe read a book and see if they came up with that job if that was one of the jobs and if they did you'd be like oh my gosh you know what one of the things you said was composer i got a composer book right here how cool or like oh you said performer what i've got i've got this cool you know like you could do that um or if they didn't you could say like one of the ones i want to have a conversation about is you know 
you all said great things. You said composer, you said performer, you said singer, you said, um, you know, but what about an inventor? Can an inventor be a music job? Can, can you invent? And you can be like, oh, composer is sort of inventing. It's like inventing music, but like, can you, can you do other kinds of inventing? Well, guess what? I got a book about <laughs> it's called uh, The Music of Life, uh, Bartolomeo Cristofori, and The Invention of the Piano. And this is a book that like I bought because it looked so beautiful and I like read through it at the bookstore and I was like, yes, I'm buying this, but then never figured out how to use it or when to use it. And so the cool thing about this is it goes through um, Cristofori's life. Um, and there's so many fun words worked in here like crescendo, becoming louder, um, or forte. Um, and it has all of these words. It also has connections of like, to give you the context from like the Medici records, like all of these actual things that are that are really cool to give context, but also to talk about how the piano was invented. Um, it is long, but it is cool. So this might be one of those asynchronous day things that you read to them, or maybe you read parts of it, or because you know there are parts where like, hmm, I wonder if he's ever gonna make it. I don't know, I guess we'll find out next time. You know, you could do, but um, this would be a super fun thing to do if you're talking about like inventors or, you know, you can't play the piano if the piano doesn't exist, you know? So you could then lead into a lesson about in inventing um, new instruments or you could explore other instruments. You could say, you know, there's so many different instruments. Have you ever heard of the auto harp or what, you know, like you could pull out instruments. So there's so many connections you could do um, with a book like this. Or you could talk about performers. There's so many fun performer books that I have. Um, like, let me see. Um, Leontine Price, Voice of a Century. Love that book. Um, this is by Carol Boston and sorry, Carol Boston Weatherford, illustrated by Raul Colon, and it's, it tells the story of Leontine Price and how she sang. There's another one. Um, oh, I thought I had another Leontine Price book here. I think I have another one at school. There's also this one, Ella Queen of Jazz. I know I've shared about this before, but it's such a fun book. Um, Dizzy, about Dizzy Gillespie. You could talk about, you know, what is it called if you uh, sing for a living? You know, you could a singer, a performer, what, what about if you just play instruments? Is that a job? Oh yeah, what do you call that person? Ooh, that's a musician, instrumentalist, pit, band? You know, like what um, What do you call that job? So it'd be fun to introduce the different way, because like, especially if you think of like a singer or an instrumentalist, like contemporary and classical and whatever, and um, for, you know, you could, uh, there's a fun thing on Disney Plus about where they talk about how like they're scoring into the unknown or whatever. You could take elements of things like that and like show the behind the scenes, stuff like that. Super fun. Um, okay, also you could talk about composers. I love this one about Charles Ives called What Charlie Heard uh, by Mordecai Gerstein. Gerstein, Gerstein. Sorry, I see Lisa, you said you missed the title. I'm gonna put all these on the links page so you'll have access to that. See. So grab that and on the links page that's at the bottom of the caption for this video but this one is super fun because it talks about all the sounds that he heard and look at all the words on the page it's just super fun because i think that he just you know it's like a it's like a different way of thinking what led him to do what he did so it's a super fun very beautifully illustrated book another one called the music in george's head um, about George Gershwin and it talks about Rhapsody in Blue and it's like a beautiful beautifully illustrated book again I wonder if I have oh yeah another one that would be really great I was not planning on talking about this one but Kalita and the Most Beautiful Song this is a really great one because it's a girl playing piano and it's not about any specific composer but talks about how she's just inspired by the music and where that leads and um, this is a would be a really 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 cool one and also again beautifully illustrated and then the one that I really really wanted to share um, this one called The Dance of the Violin. And this one tells the true story of uh, Joshua Bell. And I'll just read the first like page or two because I'm almost out of time. Sorry, so The Dance of the Violin by Kathy Stinson and illustrated by ooh, Dusan Patricius. I don't know how to pronounce that letter, sorry. I will look that up on YouTube. From the time he was very young, Joshua loved to make music. He drummed on pots, he trumpeted into cardboard tubes, and his parents found him strumming elastic bands. They bought him a violin. 
When he played his first song, a twinkling star appeared above his head. When he learned other songs, whole stories poured from his violin. One day, Joshua rushed home from his music lesson. Mom, Dad, I have to go to Kalamazoo. What's in Kalamazoo? A competition. The winner gets to perform with an orchestra. Imagine me playing with a whole orchestra. Joshua showed his teacher the music he wanted to learn. The teacher shook his head. This is a very difficult piece, even for adults. But I love it. It's soft and it's loud, it's fast, and, and this is your first competition. I hear a story in it about dancers being chased by a bear. A bear! Their ship gets lost at sea. I have to learn this piece. In that case, Joshua, let's begin. So it goes through talking about um, how tricky it was. I have to slow it down. Slow down, slow down, his teacher said. He used a metronome. Like there's so many cool connections that talk about like performance practice and how you um, get ready. And um, anyway, so the, the best part is he's getting ready. He gets there. Um, he goes in uh, to play for, uh, well, he hears other kids, right? And, and that stresses him out. He goes in to play. Um, and he screeches the very first sound he does a screech and um, he keeps going and he stumbles and he stutters and it's not good and he it says joshua stopped playing the judge sighed the competition was over joshua turned to leave the stage but and there's that sound from the floor i'd really like to start over the judge furrowed his brow all right Joshua took a deep breath and let it out. Again, he placed his violin under his chin and he raised his bow. Inside his head, two dancers appeared poised to take their first steps. He drew his bow across the string and two more dancers appeared. Soon, the notes spilling from the violin were pushing and pulling a whole room full of dancers here and there and this way and that. Red skirts twirled and black boots twirled and dancers flung each other dizzily around the room and until Joshua felt dizzy too. One final note, one final swoop, and Joshua knew from every hair on his head to the very tips of his toes that he had played better than ever before. His dancers circled round, one winked, one kissed his cheek, and then they lifted Joshua high and higher still till he could almost touch the stars. And then it talks about his, what actually happened to Joshua Bell. <laughs> is Joshua a real boy? Yes. Uh, Joshua Bell is a grown man now and one of the finest classical violinists in the world. You can learn more about his musical career at joshuabell.com. Did Joshua Bell really make a huge mistake at a competition? Yes. He was only 12 and he entered the competition and tells the piece he wanted to play um, and how he made a, a mistake. Did Joshua Bell really stop playing and ask if he'd start again? He did. Yep. <laughs> it's a true story. Um, did he win the competition that day? No, he came in third, but it doesn't say he won, right? It just says that he got lifted up. He came in third, which was really remarkable for someone so young and playing something so difficult. Um, and there were points again because he made against him because he made the mistake at the beginning, but he did go on to win many of other things, many other things. So super, super cool book. It does talk about um, how you know, how you're inspired by the music and all, like all the cool things, but I, I really love it. it talks about a mistake that someone super famous made and how they recovered and like didn't quit. And also like how his teacher's like, slow down, quit trying to rush ahead, <laughs> right? So like super good, um, but also fun to just give kids that idea of like connecting the musician with um, real life and, you know, music inspiring. And there's so many cool things about it. So. Um, all the books I shared today are on my Amazon page, um, so you can go in and <clears throat> get the ISBN number if you want to get it from your library or you want to buy it yourself from a different place, or you can buy a lot of them on Amazon, but they're all there. I'm going to go right now because I wasn't able to before the video started and finish the links page so it has all the books I talked about today, the resources I talked about today. If I miss anything, please email me. My email is makemomentsmatter at gmail.com and I will amend the links page or send you out the link. Um, but I hope this gives you some ideas of what you can do with lessons, even if you're like, but we can't sing. Can't sing live, but there are a lot of ways we can incorporate that. Or what about all the, all the other things we can do? There's so many different things. 
I'm going to have more ideas next week. I hope you'll join me again next Monday for Musical Mondays. Um, and I still won't be teaching students at that point, but I'll have lots of ideas anyway. Um, thanks for sharing your ideas with me and uh, joining in the conversation either on the Facebook page or in the comments tonight. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a great night. And good luck as you go out and do what you do in your school district. I'm sure it's going to be great. Good night, everyone.